There we go. Hi, everyone. Oh, Welcome to the Real Women Real Purpose talk show live in the On Purpose Woman magazine and global community Facebook group, Facebook page, excuse me. I'm Jenny Robertson, one of the hosts of the Real Women Real Purpose talk show, and I'm also the founder and publisher of On Purpose Woman magazine and the founder of the On Purpose Woman global community. My guest today is writer, healer, and metaphysical minister, Reverend Mielena Zachary. And we'll be talking about how to dance around your demons and specifically about the seven demons of womanhood. Um, Mia, thank you for being with me. And Mia, so I'm going to have to practice um, doing your. That's okay. Your Mia, Mia, you've known me as Mia all these I have. I have. X number of years, so stick with it. <laughs> But I, I got really excited planning this um, this discussion today and where we might go with this. So the topic, I think, is just really um, delicious. So before we do get into our topic, I want to tell our viewers a little bit about you. Reverend Mielena is a lifelong spiritual seeker and intuitive healer. She's an ordained minister of metaphysical theology and a certified master teacher of traditional Japanese healing arts. Among her many accomplishments, she is currently pursuing a doctorate in conscious centered living. Reverend Mielena believes that there are many paths and most of them lead to the one, which we experience as love. Her sole purpose is to guide others toward healing and happiness. And I'll add that she is also the author of the soon to be released book, The Messenger, Eight Keys for Resurrecting Your Life. Your book and your topic are tied together um, so let's start with you telling me what inspired you to write this book. I never expected to be writing this book. Um, to make a very long story as short as possible, uh, it was April of 2019. I was at a women's retreat in the mountains above um, Asheville, North Carolina. And during one of the meditations, um, it still feels weird to say this, that this happened because, you know, I'm not a Christian, so I was not expecting Mother Mary and Mary Magdalene to come to me, but I saw them in a vision and they showed me several things, um, including a golden egg that cracked open and revealed a book inside of it. And they gave me the title of the book and the subtitle, as well as like the, the eight keys um that are the foundation of this book and so i was kind of like me really I, I think you meant the girl on the yoga mat next to me i have no interest have no background in this i don't feel qualified i don't feel worthy but when you get called by the divine and you accept that call it is amazing the resources and the help and the support that just comes flooding in, you know, to help make this happen. So for me, it really started with a question. It's like, all right, so who is this Mary Magdalene chick anyway? You know, the only thing I knew about her was Yvonne Elliman saying, I don't know how to love him in 1973 in Jesus Christ Superstar. And the only other thing is if you look at the paintings by old masters, they always portray her as this half-dressed redheaded slut groveling at Jesus's feet. Mm -hmm. So I went to this, the source that I had, which was um, my mother's, my late mother's Bible. And it's like, so where did Mary Magdalene come from? And whatever happened to her? I mean, if this was a stage play, it would be the worst stage play possible because it's like this character that we've never heard of before just enters stage left, does some really cool stuff, and then disappears, never to be heard from again. So I was kind of thinking about, all right, well, you know, when I ask people what do they know about her, they always come up with she's a prostitute and she was possessed by the devil. And I'm like, okay, I'm not finding that anywhere in any of the scriptures, and I have 12 different Christian Bibles. And so the only place that this really comes up is in Luke 8, 1 through 3. In Luke 8, 1, Jesus is traveling, and he's got his 12 with him. And by 12, we're talking about the apostles that were named. I believe there were more that didn't get credit. And then uh, 
Luke 8, 3 talks about Joanna and Susanna and many other women who are ministering to them, the disciples, from their, the women's possessions. And I'm like, okay, cool. So he had, you know, women with financial means or they were baking, they were sewing, they were doing all the things. But it's the one in the middle, 8, 2, that caught my attention. Um, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Now, what's interesting about this is whoever the author may have been of the gospel according to Luke, not by Luke, but according to Luke, whoever the author was or whoever was you know, the copyist or the editor years later, this was written a hundred years after the fact by someone who did not know Jesus when he was alive and teaching. So I'm thinking somebody took a little bit of liberty with, with uh, Mary Magdalene here. So I started thinking, what would someone's, I guess, life or experience be that seven demons were cast out? Now, in first century Palestine, it's a different time. They didn't have modern medicine. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have the, the amount of knowledge we have now. So everything from a toothache to epilepsy was caused by demons and evil spirits. So it really made me wonder, was she really possessed by the devil? Which I don't believe in the devil anyway. I believe, you know, um, Satan actually translates as deceiver. And I'm thinking, what's the biggest deceiver that we deal with even today? It's the ego. It's the lie of separation from our creator. So in the messenger book, I kind of created, I made up a backstory for Mary Magdalene. Um, and I was supposing that she had been raped. And the reason that that would be such an incredibly traumatic thing is there was no crisis hotline there was no support group there was no medical rape kit to prove you know there was no way to prove this you know so as far as the community was concerned she must have done something to deserve it you and know she was, she, spoiled. She was, she was yeah spoiled. she was who up there's a she was ruined she yeah. was unmarriageable she would never have a family of her own you know she wasn't good enough anymore mm -hmm. and so what you know i feel like the demons of trauma that would have been cast out of her you know, were the ones that are typical to any rape victim. But as I was kind of getting prepared for this interview today, I started thinking, well, what kind of demons are women, W-O-M-X-N, you know, I want to be inclusive of both cis female and trans female, what demons are we dealing with today? And so I kind of had to come up with my own list. So you have a list of the seven demons of womanhood, which just that title grabbed me because, you know, throughout that history, the Bible history, our own history, the country's history, the world's history, there has been this diminishment of women. I know there were cultures that really honored women and women had great um, responsibilities and ran things, but that hasn't been the norm for certainly what we've seen in our lifetime. And so the seven demons of womanhood, that could almost also have been written by somebody, you know, a thousand years ago to castigate women, right? Yeah. Because women are probably more, more apt to be possessed by a demon than men, just because of our natural frailties and lack oh, of, well, <laughs> right? The, the, the thinking of the day was because we have an extra opening that oh, that's how the demons really? get in. Everything comes back to sex. Wow. wow. You know, yeah. Thank you, yeah. patriarchy. Yeah, right. Um, and so you came up with the seven demons of womanhood, which um, I'm assuming these are all some that you also are your demons as well, because um, you and I've talked about this and you, you understand that your demons may be different from my demons, but there are some that are really common, I think, to most women. And when I read this list, they all hit me somewhere but some had a juicier charge. I'm going to read the seven really quick. And we're going to talk about the first one that we really want to delve into. So being good. And let me also say, these were things that we've been, girl. We've been be praising. Be quiet, be pretty. 
good girl. You're so nice. Mm -hmm. Oh, look how pretty she is. Oh, virtuous. That's not a word we hear, but yet we hear all the words around it. Yeah. That, you know, what's that old thing? You're supposed to be a, a Madonna in the kitchen and a whore in the bedroom, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to claim expertise that I don't have. Um, Karen King, Cynthia Borgalt, you know, there are other people, Elaine Pagels. There are, you know, very respected scholars who have done much more work on this. But there's also, um, you know, this school of thought that the two Marys, Mary the mother and Mary Magdalene, are actually archetypes for the ideal at that time. You've got the virgin and the whore. And that is, you know, so there's that black and white that women were expected to fit into. That is so interesting. The other three, busy. Oh, and we'll talk more about my experience of busy. Selfless. Oh, you just give so, you're just always giving to others. Yeah. And fruitful. What do you mean exactly by fruitful? Fruitful is a really tough one. And it's a very, um, it's a very sensitive trigger for a lot of women folks. I don't know how to do that when you can't see the X in, in my word. Um, some of us, you know, it, it's like, go forth and be fruitful. We're supposed to get married and have babies as soon as possible. But, you know, some of us had a lot of trouble getting pregnant. Some of us aren't able to get pregnant. Some of us don't want to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's still a demon around. I mean, as soon as you're pregnant, it's like, oh, that's so great. And then as soon as the baby comes, when are you having the next one? You know, mm -hmm. you guys have been married for X number of years. When are you going to have a baby? You know, it's all about the babies. And, you know, for women who have experienced miscarriages like I have, you know, women who have experienced, you know, infertility, this is a demon that's in your face every single day. And I would like to put in a caveat because I know that this is on purpose women global community. These were really seven, you know, my seven demons as a woman of, you know, Western first world culture. I recognize and I acknowledge that the demons of someone in a third or second world country are much different than the petty little things that I'm dealing with. Which aren't so petty in the culture that we live in, but thank you for that. So let's do, let's do busy. The demon of busy. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> That's a demon that visited me just this very morning, you know, in, I always want to show up with my best. And so I have, I tend to overthink and therefore I over prepared. But in the shower this morning, I'm like, okay, I've got six pages of notes and I need to remember this and I need to remember that. And then I thought, oh my God, just stop. You've made this interview busy now. This interview is too busy now. Why? And I think it kind of goes hand in hand for me personally with some of the other demons of wanting to be selfless, wanting to be nice, wanting to be good, wanting to be pretty. So, you know, in wanting to show up as this idealized version of myself, I made myself really busy this morning. And then I decided, no, you know what? I'm cutting everything. I have one sheet of paper in front of me now, but how often do we do this to ourselves? Yeah. Oh yeah. And how wonderful that you are in this place in your life where you recognize it. You know, if you're like me, you may recognize it three days down the road or in the next five seconds. But eventually you probably come to this conclusion of, yeah, this is exactly what I'm teaching and, and writing about. And here it is, another experience for me to have to um, actually to teach it, teach other women. You were just had a teachable moment for other women in that, because how many of us can recognize that? And then when you get into that busy space, uh, do you find that then you get more stressed, you get more anxious about the interview itself, because now the perfection mod mode has kicked in and you don't want to make any mistakes. So you can't be your real authentic self showing up. Because a exactly. real authentic self it probably could make a, a little faux pas, could say something wrong and could mess something up and oh well, right? That came up for me today as well. Um, I have to show up with my imperfections. I have to show up 
a little tired, a little sore, a little low energy because I'm, you know, the weather's overcast today and that brings me down a little bit, but really busy, that for me is less to do with my schedule and my to-do list than with my self-esteem. And what I mean by that is I use busy as a way to hide for decades and decades, you know? When I, when my social anxiety would come up, oh, I'm sorry, I can't come to that party, I'm busy. Oh, we're gonna, you know, um, have this brainstorming meeting about, you know, this really cool idea. Well, you know, everybody else in the room had decades more experience than me, they had more college degrees than I did, so, oh, I'm busy, I can't make that meeting, but, you know, thanks for thinking of me and maybe next time. And then the other thing that I recognize from past behavior, busy kept me from drowning. And what I, if you picture a little duck that just looks like it's gliding along the surface, but underneath its little legs are going like this, that's kind of how my acute um, severe depression was. You know, on the surface, everybody thought I had everything together, that I was strong and confident, but underneath, I was paddling as fast as I could, staying busy, because as long as I had something to do, as long as I had a self-imposed deadline, as long as I had another project, another paper, another class, another workshop, it kept me from sinking further into sadness. Mm -hmm. And so the problem with that is busy becomes addictive. And one of the things I've noticed over the last couple of days is now that I have submitted the final interior documents for this book, the final cover art for this book, I'm finding myself looking for stuff to do because my brain has been addicted to that adrenaline and that endorphin rush and those um, oxytocin hormones that reward you for spinning your wheels constantly. But um, I'm really happy that, you know, when this book comes out on the 5th of October, to quote Auntie Maxine Waters, I am reclaiming my time. <laughs> That's so great. That's so great. I, I, I thank you so much for sharing how, how busy affects you and how it helped you to hide out. Probably, like you said, kept you from drowning, maybe saved you in some instances. It gave you something else to focus on. And the other didn't go away. It's always there. It, it didn't. Um, I think in a lot of ways, depression might be, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not claiming that, but my experience of alcoholism and my experience of depression are kind of the same. They don't get cured. They don't go away. I have just figured out how to dance with my demons and I'm blessed with like incredible willpower. You know, I can have one beer and cut myself off. I realize not everybody can do that. But the same thing with the depression, thank you, God, I'm at a place now where I recognize, you know, life's a roller coaster. And, you know, this is your normal highs and lows, but I recognize when it seems like I'm going a little too far down. And I can kind of get a hold of that now by doing some of the dancing steps that we're going to talk about later. Okay, thank you. Well, before we move on, I want to just say a few words about my experience of busy because it's, it's very different from yours, which is I love because there will be women who can relate to both of our experiences, I think. I use busy, I, you know, I don't even know that I have a word right now, but I loved people noticing how busy I was. And women would say, Jenny, I don't know how you do it all. You just always, you do this and you do this. And it wasn't that I wanted them to like me or pray. it wasn't about the praise. It was about, I guess it was an identity for me as Jenny gets things done, which, um, and I would say things like, oh, you know, it's nothing. I'm just really good at that. Or, and inside what I knew for sure was, yeah, but I got two hours of sleep last night. Yeah, and the weekend comes and I don't have any fun because I'm still, I've taken on way too much. But there was something very addictive and juicy about people noticing my busyness. And, and so I don't really know quite what that was feeding. I'm sure it has to do with some self-esteem stuff because, oh, I would have needed that otherwise. Where now, 
I hope nobody ever says that to me again, because that's not, not the model I want to portray. And I will say that I have gotten really, really, really talented at doing nothing. I can You've got something you started this year, didn't you? Um, like where you take a day off? Yes. I started in January when I do my, you know, New Year's Day kind of plan for the year. What do I want to shift and change? And what do I, how do I want to show up? I decided I was going to put a free day on my calendar every week, Monday through Friday, not, oh, I'm going to, you know, have a free day on Saturday. No, I may have a free day on Saturday and Sunday as well that I had to, that was, it was non-negotiable. And that means that I don't mind stacking up four Zoom meetings in a row. Because there's this something about waking up in the morning and, and a free day doesn't mean I don't work necessarily, but it means that I wake up with this idea that I can structure my day the way I want, that I don't have to comb my hair if I don't feel like it, <laughs> that I don't have to turn on technology unless I really want to. And some days I managed, some weeks rather, I managed to get two in a couple of weeks, I got three, wow. but I had five or six Zoom meetings, but I thought, man, the hair's combed, the lipstick's on, why well, don't I just you know, do them all at one time, because I, you know, that doesn't, um, doing Zoom meetings really kind of energizes me rather than deflates me, so it works great for me, and here we are, you know, going in our 10th month into the year, and I'm really proud of myself, because I don't always stick to things like that that are just for me, you know, that the self-care piece, but that's become, as I hit this new monumental decade in October, that becomes even more important. So it really is, and, you know, that's interesting that you say that, that the self-care has become a more important piece because I feel like that's really another big demon for me and a lot of the women I know is that selfless piece. Um, I wasn't gonna go into it today because I don't know enough about it, but there's something called the Proverbs 31 woman and it's based on the Christian Bible, Proverbs chapter 31 verses 10 through 30 and it's like, Oh, she gets up early in the morning and she works really hard and she gets the servants up and she does all the laundry and she runs her husband's business and she always looks great doing it and she helps the community. And I thought all that woman wants to do is put her feet up and be left alone. You know, I, if there is someone watching who is a Proverbs 31 woman, I would love to have the conversation around, you know, what that means for you and how it serves you, um, it just doesn't work for me personally. So please understand that I don't mean any insult to anyone who's watching, but it seems to me that Proverbs 31 woman is a very, very high bar. And I mean, we've been, we kind of started in the 60s and 70s, my mother and Ginny, probably you personally, it's like, no, we can have it all. We can fry up the bacon and bring it home in the, we can bring, what is that stupid commercial for Anjali it's perfume? I can bring home the bacon and fry it up in the pan. And, and never ever let you forget you're a man. Right, right. But, you know, got to take the apron off in the middle of all that and go do whatever I'm supposed to do now in the bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, you know, we have this, oh, you can have it all. And what we have now is chronic fatigue syndrome. We have neurological overload. We have permanent exhaustion. We have brains that never get out of the fight or flight, you know, process of hormone and chemical dump because we're busy being selfless and putting everybody else before ourselves. So I think at least for me, that busy demon and that selfless demon really go hand in hand and they feed each other in this nasty little cycle. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I would guess too, I, I didn't really come into the feminist kind of mindset until the early 70s, because I was, you know, I was, I guess it was, um, I was 21 in 1972. And so I started to think more about political things. I was watching what was going on out there. But I would dare say that, that if you talk to women who were fully immersed in that mindset, that they wouldn't have thought they were being selfless at all because they were taking their power, they were doing all these things for themselves. However, what I think happened is we started to think that we had to that we didn't that we had to choose one or the other kind of way of being. So you can either be a stay-at-home mom or you can be a career woman. You can't be a mother who works because that's wrong. You can't be a stay-at-home mother because then you're not out there fulfilling your potential. There were these two within women fighting each other, these two models of what it meant to be female. Well, if you do this, you're selfless. If you do that, you're, 
you're, you're selfless too, or you're not worthy. So, you know, women who went out and got a career were sometimes seen as either bold and ambitious, or how dare you put your child in daycare? You're just a right. bad mother. Women who stayed home were either seen as nurturing, wonderful, you know, Mary Magdalene types, or idiots. Well, you're just, you're just too dumb to go get a job. I mean, right. they weren't spoken necessarily, but there were these things that really started to splinter women. So I think that what happened is we thought we we could have it all, and then we tried to have it all. So we did the, okay, I'm going to have children, and I'm going to work, or I'm going to stay home, but I'm also going to do all these other things to prove that I'm worthy. So I'll volunteer for the PTA, and I'll, you know, it all goes back to we busy to find how we were seen in the world, what we got accomplished. And so I love this conversation because I don't think I've ever put that together quite the way I just did before. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I used to brag about it. I, there was even a hashtag 3 a.m. challenge that I started because it's like, I'm up at 3 a.m., look at me, I'm so important, I'm so busy. And I'm like, Lord, what was wrong with me? Well, actually I know. I was insecure and I was depressed and I was lonely and I was trying to make up for it by appearing more important than maybe I really was. Um, and I think I'm going to, yeah, you know what? I am going to go there. I'm going to talk about pro-choice. Okay. I am not talking about abortion though. I want to talk about pro-choice as in maybe we choose not to have it all. Maybe we choose not to do some of it. Um, maybe that's the fruitful. We choose not to be fruitful, but I'm excited. Man, something happened at 40. Excuse my language for a second, but at 40, I discovered I just had no more fucks to give. <laughs> you know, I got tired of being good. I'd rather be accountable mm. for my own actions but at the same time, be mindful of the decisions that I'm making and not always do the things that other people think is good. You know, I got tired of being nice because nice girls often get mistaken for doormats. I'm actually one of those spike strips that the cops put out to stop the speeding cars, but I had to pretend to be nice. I hope though, I really feel like I've wrestled that demon to the ground and I've chosen something that I believe my late mother was, you know, if you ever asked me to describe her in one word, my mother was kind. Mm. Now, was she always nice? No, but kind is another thing. And sometimes yeah. kind doesn't show up as nice. It shows up as honest. Mm -hmm. It shows up as compassionate because sometimes being kind is saying things people don't want to hear, but need to, you know, pretty. Um, I think I still wrestle with that. There's so many TV shows and magazines and commercials just always showing me all the things that I'm not. But I think in the Western culture, that's just a demon we're going to have to bear until people finally recognize how absolutely magnificently wondrously sexy women over 50 really are and i have to say I something speak, about that yeah, go. um i one of the greatest compliments my mother could ever get when i was a little girl we're talking three four five but i remember was oh jenny always looks so pretty she looks like she just she stepped what they used to say she stepped out of a band box i never even know what that meant but she, she's just, you know, she's so always so clean and neat. And my mother would dress me up and I felt like sometimes she would put me up on a shelf like a little doll. Hmm. I had the prettiest clothes, but they weren't. And I had, you know, just, and I, I say that to say it starts young. It can start really young to, um, I, I was entered into a little beauty contest when I was three and a half, but it wasn't really about beauty. I don't remember much of it. I just remember, and I think some of it had to do with you, 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 gave money to this charity and you got votes or something. It wasn't based on <laughs> talent or beauty. Or, but I came, I got an award for being, oh, what did they call it? Um, best personality. I got best personality. And I, I would have, I would have voted that for you. I would have voted that. Because that's like, you know, that was seen as like the consolation prize for the girls who weren't as pretty as the pretty girls, right? Oh, she got the, oh, she's the personality. So I just look back at that. Now I was three and a half. I didn't even know what a personality was. But yet, 
I'm here, what, 60 some years later, I'm here still talking about that because it, it was just this thing ingrained into the culture. And we have definitely made some good shifts on that. We yeah. have, but it was, God, there's not enough money in Fort Knox to pay me to relive those years. There really isn't. I was tall like taller than all of the boys in my class. I was so skinny that people used to ask me in public bathrooms whether I was going to throw up my meal. Oh, no. You know? And then I had braces and glasses, you know, no curves. And I mean, oh my gosh. So to put it in perspective, you know, the my first introduction to the demon of pretty was in 1980 when Brooke Shields who was the same age as me was on the cover of Vogue. And I realized I don't look anything like that. I'm never going to look anything like that. I'm never going to be the kind of pretty that white marketing America wants me to be. And you'd think I'd be over that shit, but here we are. And I'm still like, Oh my gosh, I've got to lose 20 pounds. Oh, this shirt is so old. You know, I need new clothes. It's, I just think, for me, all of the seven demons that we listed, which are mine, and all of the demons that other, I think they're all based on fear. Oh, yeah. You know, it's fear of being criticized and fear of not fitting in, fear of, oh gosh, not belonging. That's a huge fear. Um, fear of being rejected in any way, really. Um, and in, in the messenger, in chapter eight, um, the grace chapter, there's a part that talks about, um, actually, I'm going to read it because I don't have it memorized. Um, there is no greater illusion than fear, no greater tragedy than discontentment, no greater wrong than preparing for war, and no greater misfortune than having an enemy. And the reason I think that's so powerful is because, oh gosh, it's a Will Smith movie where he stars with his son. And when I say the quote, most people will know it because he says something about danger is real, but fear is a choice. And I think that really brings it home about how fear is an illusion, you know, and the body doesn't know the difference. For example, the little butterflies and the throat tightening that I had just before you hit the start button today, the body doesn't know the difference between um, distress and eustress. So it's just a matter of choosing. Is there real danger here? No. Then I don't need to be afraid. I can tell myself that that throat closing and that nervousness and those butterflies are excitement rather than nervousness. We can, we have the power to dance with that demon. You know, um, no greater tragedy than discontentment. If this is the way God made me, then why am I unhappy with this, with being tall and skinny? Well, used to be skinny, now cur more curvy, you know, with glasses and crooked teeth. And there's no greater misfortune than having an enemy. Well, I don't want to speak for all women, whether cis or trans, but I think at the end of the day, we are usually our own worst enemy. We criticize ourselves in ways. I mean, I say things to myself that I would never in a million, million years say to you. And that's just wrong. That's just wrong. If you would think, you would think or you wouldn't want to hurt my feelings. But right. we, can hurt our, we can hurt ourselves with that. Again, um, wow, we've touched on so many. <laughs> Each one of these demons could be a full show, couldn't it? Well, I'm actually hoping to turn it into an article for On Purpose Woman magazine at some point. Maybe um, for great. anybody who's watching who doesn't know about that, do you want to say a couple words about the magazine? Oh, I'm sure I will. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, I am the founder and publisher of On Purpose Woman magazine. It is an online magazine. We actually were a print publication for 12 years and a couple of years ago took it online. You can reach it at onpurposewomanmagazine.com. And I'm always looking for women who want to uh, submit articles or be our cover artist or advertise in the magazine. And it's, it's a force for good. And it's a place where women's voices can be seen and heard. And it's full of delicious, delicious, amazing 
um, words and resources for your mind, your body, your spirit, and your business. And I would love to have you do maybe a something like a series each issue. Pick and that pick, you know start with busy and go from there and, see. and go from there. Yeah, yeah. I would love to do that. I would love to do that. So then I will um, just summarize for those of you who are watching who actually came to go. Okay, you said you were going to teach us how to dance around our demons. How do we do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, again, this is just my own personal process. I invite you to come up with your own. You don't have to do it my way. I mean, that's the whole point of dancing with the demons of womenhood. I don't have to do it the way she does. She doesn't have to do it the way Ginny does. You know, we can all do it our own way. But I really do feel like the first step in this dance is to face your fears, you know, to acknowledge that you even have them. I didn't realize until a couple of years ago that I really fear being in the public spotlight. Um, hopefully I look poised and collected and confident today, but this is not my jam, to be honest, you know. So and the first yet, thing you keep doing things to put you in the spotlight, which is so very cool. That's me dancing with this demon. You know, this book is more important than I am. I have to show up. I have to speak up. Um, examining the source of your fear and determining how the fear helps you. That's a big one. That's a big one. I spent way too many years in victim mentality. I was always the damsel in distress who was behind on her rent or the refrigerator was empty or I didn't have money for gas in my car. I was always afraid of not having money. And that just showed up as this perpetual victim cycle. And I had to really sit with that demon and go, what's the point of this? Well, here's the thing for someone who's all, oh, you're so strong. You're so smart. You're so capable. Nobody helps strong, powerful, capable women. They don't. They make and a lot of assumptions. Yes. That the yeah. yeah. They assume we don't need it. So that was the, you know, the, the fear demon that I had to dance with. So you've got to, you know, that first step is face those fears. The second step to this dance is to separate your demons from your identity. Oh, good one. Who am I really? You know, am I that person who is so afraid of everything, everything that I have to put on a fake identity? I have to put on a fake persona. I have to turn myself into nice, pretty, good things that I'm not really. I am a snarky, judgmental bitch. I really am. I try not to do that on a personal level, but I know who I am. And God loves me anyway, just the way I am. And that's something that we've got to learn is it's like, are you more than your fears? Of course you are. Of course you are. And so the next step after you realize that your fears are not you is to learn how to do this dance. So if you'll allow me, I'm going to quote from the, from the messenger again. This particular part is from, um, I think, chapter seven, which is um, the path. Quote, the dualities, I'm going to read this again, the dualities of aversion and desire so aversion things we don't like desire things we do like they both surface from illusion because when you decide that something is beautiful ugliness is created when you decide someone is good evil is created and so it is that existence and non-existence give birth the one to the idea of the other so here's where the dance comes in, this next quote from the same chapter. From non-existence, things come your way. Do not stop them. From existence, things are lost. Let them go. So what's the point I'm trying to make here? So let's say it's the demon of pretty. You know, you're flipping through your favorite magazine and you're like, oh, God, she's so perfect whatever that means to you, 
you know, whether it's her hair, her body, her makeup, her clothes, you know, whatever. And so from non-existence, this, this pop, I'm speaking from personal experience, jealousy comes up, insecurity comes up, low self-esteem comes up, self-hatred comes up, self-judgment comes up, all these things come up. But the part of this dance is don't stop them. Let them come, let it come up deal with it, face it, don't stuff it down and repress it. But now here's the other part of that dance from existence, things are lost, let them go. So when I see that magazine article and I'm like, Oh God, she's so pretty. Stop it there. Make it a period, not a semicolon. You don't have to continue that sentence. <laughs> because you may appreciate that she's pretty in your mind, right? Exactly. And I, you don't have to take that next step to play the comparison game. So this is where from existence, things are lost, let them go. Are there, are there real demons? That's probably a conversation for another day. Um, I do believe that there are low vibrational energies that affect our well being. But for the most part, I think the demons that we deal with, especially as women, they're not even ours. They've been dumped on us by the society and the culture that we live in and we're raised in. And anytime we want to, when you're sick of dancing, slay that thing and move on. <laughs> we'll have to schedule like a dance party to do that, right? Oh, that would be fun. That would be fun, especially maybe for celebrate. Halloween. Yeah. A part of your book launch celebration, maybe. <laughs> you. I might do that. That's a great idea. Well, Mia, how can people find your book and when will it be available? And what else do you want to tell them about what you offer out there? Well, I am super excited. Um, I offer a lot of things and you can find those on the website, um, which is the messenger, M-E-S-S-E-N-G-E-R, number eight keys, K-E-Y-S.com. So it's the messenger eight keys.com. And so the book, which I will show you. Now, this was the original book. Now, don't let the demons of judgment come up, y'all, because yes, I did make this all by myself, but this is the proof copy. Pull it back just a little bit and then- Oh, there it, we go. Yeah, and I'll put it forward a little bit more. Okay. Well, there you go. Yes, I'm going to be able- Oh, yeah, we can really see it now. Thank you. Yeah, so that's, you know, that's the original one. But on the 5th of October, 2021, you get to see- Ta-da! Wow. I don't know if you can see that. You don't have to keep pushing that one back and forth. It just pops right here. There beautiful. we go. It is beautiful. So yeah, that's the real book cover and you get to see it first. Woohoo! <laughs> Nobody else has seen that but you and yours, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, so basically, uh, between today, which is the 21st of September, 2021, and the 5th of October, that is 15 days from now. I am doing something kind of cool, and I will put this on Facebook and on Instagram and other places. But basically, I'm offering a three for one special, if you will, because quite frankly, I did not spend two and a half years working on this book and creating it for it to sit in my living room. So if you choose to pre order this book between today and October 5th, and you prove it to me, just send me a copy of the receipt. I will immediately send you a digital copy of the book so you can start reading it early. And then when you get your hardcover, take a video giving it away. I, I have to have proof that you gave it away to somebody. And when you do that, when you give away your copy, I'm gonna replace it with an autographed copy. So you're basically buying one book, but getting three because I am asking, and I don't ask for much. It is not in my nature to ask for help, but I truly, truly need help getting this book out into the world where it can do some good. I believe, you know, when people ask me, what is the book about? What is the messenger eight keys for resurrecting your life about? On the surface, it's a retelling of a very familiar story about a first century teacher. But below the surface, it's a step-by-step -step 
self-help guide for personal transformation, for first transforming yourself and then your family and then your community. And then if enough of us do the work to quote Brene Brown, we might be able to change the world. That sounds incredibly arrogant, but guess what? That's not my demon to dance with. This is an incredibly amazing, marvelous, wonderful, I am bragging on myself book. I have worked hard to make it so, and I had a lot of help to make it so. So one more time, I don't know if you can see this, but basically pre-order it, prove it, read the PDF, give yours away, and I will replace it with an autographed copy. And you can find all the details about that at www.themessenger8keys.com. Oh, that's such a beautiful idea. And I, I'm assuming you'd like us to give it away before we read it. <laughs> oh, well. Geared and, you know, stuff like that, right? Yeah. We'll get into circulation faster that way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love that idea. Can somebody give their book away on Zoom if they if they do it or a Facebook Live if they have somebody? Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. Absolutely. Love However you do it, just do me a favor and, you know, tag me or hashtag me or at tag me. Just mm -hmm. let me know that you've done it mm -hmm. and then I'll be in touch. I will get your mailing address and I will replace your copy. Now, that is only for per for books that are purchased between today and the 5th of October. After that, you get to keep your copy. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's not that's 15 days that people or 14 days at least that people can have to do that. I love it. I have to make a note to do that myself. And I just want to say that just what you've read from the book, what you talked about, I know that everything that we talked about today is not like written out in the book, but but it ties in to a lot of your thoughts in the book, but just the things that you read from the book. I, I thought a couple of times, oh my gosh, how did she know that? How did she get that? How did she? And I, I just look so forward to reading it. And I think you're really onto something here with, um, with how you've approached this and I think you're going to help a lot of women and a lot of people. There are people, there are men out there that are um, are looking to to shift and change in the same way, and I think can relate to this. So, thank any you for that wisdom here. I really appreciate that. Um, I don't know how to answer how I came up with that. Um, it wasn't there even are people, like you know, there are people who are going to say, "Well, where did you get that idea?" And I'm going to say it was Mother Mary and Mary Magdalene who wrote this book through me. And I don't care how that sounds. I really do not. Um, because there were so many times where I had page fright, mm. didn't know what needed to be there, didn't know what to go. And then I would just hear this little voice go, Isaiah 42, 2. And I would flip to that. And that would be exactly what I needed in that moment. So I think, I think the last thing I want to say is really... I'm going it, to, it's a quote from chapter seven, again, the path. And this particular quote comes from the Tao Te Ching, because that's the other thing people might not know. You might think that, oh, I don't want to read that book because it's for Christians. It's really not. I'm not Christian. And what I've done with this book is I have taken passages from the Christian Bible, from the Gnostic Gospels and other apocryphal texts, from the Tao Te Ching and from the Bhagavad Gita, and I've combined them. And unless you look at the reference numbers in the end notes at the back of the book, I don't think you're gonna know which came from where, because this is foundational, how to treat each other with love and kindness instructions. So I think this really sums up for me the experience of writing The Messenger and I hope that it kind of informs the way that people read the messenger. So quote, if you seek knowledge, you will learn something new every day. But when you seek the way, you must unlearn something new every day. And I think that's really what dancing with our demons comes down to. We have to unlearn the things that we've lied to ourselves about. Perfect. And I'll just add my ending here that I remember reading many years ago 
and I'm, I'm not quoting it directly and I don't even know who said it, but it was about God is about subtraction, not addition. Yeah. Yeah. But that resonates with me as well. What you just said. So thank you. me. Thank you. Thank you. Reverend Mielina. <laughs> Mielina. Thank you. I'll get it right now. Thank you, Reverend Mielina. For, um, thank you, for Jenny. Wonderful discussion. Um, I'm just really psyched about us getting this out there too and having more people um, hear what we had to say and what you offered here today. And I want to thank all of you for joining us for the Real Women, Real Purpose talk show live in the On Purpose Woman magazine and global community Facebook page. If you love this interview and want to share it with your friends in about 48 hours or so, it will be up on our YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is the On Purpose Woman global community. Go there, hit subscribe so you'll know when we put up a new interview. And right now there's over 80 interviews with real purpose, real women who are out there living their purpose. And, and it, I mean, some of the interviews are educational, inspirational, joyful, or all three combined into one. So there's something there for everyone. And um, let's see, here's what's coming up. We only have, uh, I think, three more interviews this month. Tomorrow, no, on Thursday, uh, Catherine Yarborough, who is the other host of the Real Women, Real Purpose talk show, will be talking with Tammy Workman Lopez about five steps to release anxiety. Ooh, that'll be good. Yeah. And on Monday, Catherine's actually going to be interviewing me about my 21 years in business because we'll be Ooh. celebrating the 21th anniversary of the On Purpose Woman Global Community all through the month of October. And then next Tuesday will be the final one for the month. And I'll be talking with Lilia Shoshana Ray about you are brilliant, shine your light, which I think is the message we all are bringing to the planet right now. So thank you again, Reverend Mialena, for being with me. Thank you for watching the Real Women, Real Purpose talk show out there. And catch us next time. Thank you, Jenny. Bye.